I want to welcome everybody to our annual Trauma Burn Day Away. It's uh, a pleasure to see all of you on a not working day. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, someone that's very well respected and loved in the SICU. Our first speaker is, doc is Professor of Surgery, Dr. Raul Coimbra. Dr. Coimbra is the Chief of Trauma, Surgical Critical Care, Burn Division. His numerous awards, appointments, and professional activities established Dr. Coimbra as an internationally renowned figure in the world of trauma. To us, Dr. C is a passionate and exceptional provider, educator, and leader that we are so proud to work with. Please welcome Dr. Raul Coimbra as he shares a fluid resuscitation update with us this morning. Dr. Coimbra. Thank you, Juana, for your kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, this is probably the best conference I go, although I go to a lot of conferences, just because this is put together by us for ourselves. So uh, it's, it's good to do this stuff at home. Um, every, every year we do, we do this, and, and it's always exciting to see uh, uh, us uh, working, putting together some stuff that uh, is new, just to give you an update of what's going on in, in trauma, in the science, in the literature. Uh, but it's a, it's a nice venue for us to interact and to uh, work a little bit outside of the trauma center and outside of the SICU. Um, I was asked to talk about uh, new strategies in fluid resuscitation and what's going on in trauma resuscitation in general. There are a few things that um, <clears throat> have happened in the last uh, several years due to this new military conflict that have affected the way civilian trauma surgeons are practicing that I will share with you. And then I'll tell you some uh, new developments about um, our resuscitation uh, outcomes consortium trial, the ROC trial that just ended and what the, the results were. Uh, every time we talk about fluid, re fluid resuscitation, uh, somebody asks, oh, how about the endless controversy of colloid and crystalloid? Uh, I think uh, this has been settled um, and for trauma resuscitation and for people that are bleeding if you're going to give fluids, you definitely give, should give crystalloid initially and use colloid at the later uh, time point, may, maybe in the intensive care unit. The classic ATLS teaching says that we should give two liters of crystalloid, either normal saline or lactated ringers, to every trauma patient that comes through the door. And that's the way I was trained. Uh, 20 years ago, and that's how most of our trauma nurses that have been doing this for a long time were taught as well. And if you remember, not long ago, uh, we were still getting two, was mandatory to get two large bore IVs and give two liters of crystalloid, and everybody was getting that much. Then ATLS said you give two liters. Good morning. <laughs> you give two liters, you reevaluate, and then if the patient still needs more, you give two more. And then if the patient needs something else, maybe you should start thinking about blood. So in the process of care, two liters, reevaluation, two more liters, reevaluation, maybe blood. So blood came a lot later than, than we are using it now. So this was the classic teaching, and I'm just presenting this to you because this, this is changing, changing very rapidly. And there are two questions on the table now. One is whether or not aggressive fluid resuscitation is necessary at all. Do we need to give that much fluid to trauma patients? And the second question is, should we be using very little or no crystalloid and start blood transfusion instead? So the, this paradigm is shifting again and the two questions are, we give fluids, should we do it? Should we keep doing it? And if the answer is yes, are we doing the right, are, are we using the right one? And then uh, I always think about ATLS, not as, as the end of the line, but as the beginning. So if you think that ATLS is what trauma care is all about, 
you know, that's wrong because ATLS is just what we do in that first 30 minutes or so. And I always question myself, can we do better than ATLS? Can we do something beyond ATLS that will help us? And I think one, obviously one of the things is how quickly you recognize that someone's in shock. And recently, a lot of people have explored the use of vasopressors instead of fluids for trauma patients. And I think that's still not uh, uh, ready for prime time. Uh, the, the consensus nowadays is that trauma patients, if they need something, they need volume and they don't need pressors. There were some studies done recently using vasopressin and norepinephrine uh, in um, animal models of hemorrhagic shock. And the data looked pretty good. Everybody got excited. But remember, humans are not dogs and, or rats. And what you do in the laboratory has to be translated to clinical practice. But we've got to be careful about that. So at this point, vasopressors are not ready for prime time. Maybe in the future we'll learn a little more about it, but that's not what we are using. But some things have changed, though. The, the, again, as I said, the priority before was to give fluids. Now the priority is to control bleeding and then give fluids. So we, we inverted things a little bit. Uh, it, it matters how quickly you put your finger in that blood vessel that's bleeding or you embolize the the pelvis that's bleeding or you take the spleen out and perhaps that's more important than giving a lot of fluid up front and I'll explain to you why. And the new trend is to give blood and FFP a lot earlier than we used to in the last, you know, five years ago or so. One thing that uh, we are blessed to have here in this trauma center that is not something that everybody has in, across the country is the opportunity to take people from the street into the operating room. So we have this great OR resuscitation protocol that uh, you're gonna hear in great detail later today. I'm just gonna use this to, to introduce that topic. But we have, there are a number of uh, criteria that we use, five of them. Uh, five criteria that we use to take people that are unstable from the streets straight into the operating room. And I think when, when, you, when you think about it, you know, we just take it for granted because we've had it for a long time. But it took us about 20 years to co collecting data to show that that resource is really valuable, that that resource is really important. Because you, you may not know, but every year uh, I... I I receive a lot of pressure from the administration and from other surgeons to give that room away. So I tell people we have only 10 ORs in the main OR and they say, no, we have 11. I say, no, we have 10 because that one is ICU real estate that we use for resuscitations, but they want to take it away. So one way we can maintain that resource is to show to people that it's very important, it saves lives. Well, but we don't do that very often and we use that maybe 50, 60 times a year, so it's about once a week. And it took us 20 years to accumulate enough data, but finally we did. About two or three years ago, we wrote the first paper on OR resus. And what we did is we compare mortality uh, of patients, mortality rate in patients that have very little injuries. Guys that have an injury that mortality is greater than 70%. And if they go to the operating room, straight from the street, it means that they are sicker than if they go to the trauma bay. But yet, we have a small number of patients that went to the trauma bay with those little injuries, and for whatever reason, they were more stable. So we understood that we are not comparing apples to apples because this group is stable, this group is not stable. But in the end, what, they ma what made them equal was that they have little injuries. It turns out that if you come in with a pressure above 80, and you don't go to the operating room it's straight, but you have a lethal injury, such as an aortic injury, your chances of dying are 40% higher than if you are sicker, but you go to the operating room for an OR recess. So the operating room resuscitation had a 40% higher survival than patients with the same injuries, which were even more stable but we're resuscitating the trauma bay. And when we look at all the variables, the only difference is that we were able to put our finger in that blood vessel that's bleeding 
a lot faster. Everything else was the same. Transfusion, everything else was the same. But what was different is that from admission to control of bleeding, it took us on average for those injuries, 12 minutes. And when you go to the trauma bay, no matter how fast we move, and we are very efficient in the trauma bay because of the work we do together, but no matter how you look at it, it's always 35 minutes to 40 minutes until you obtain hemostasis in the operating room because you always do something else in the, in the trauma bay. It's the second IV. Oh, let's get the chest X-ray before we go. And let's roll before we go. And let's do this and let's do that which is all appropriate because the patient is stable and you should be doing those things, but it takes more time. So there was a, this is a piece of resource that I'm, you all know about this, but I'm very proud that we have it because it's something beyond ETLS that is not taught and not publicized enough that uh, trauma centers should have. So let's go back to this issue of fluids. Are fluids needed at all? So I want to introduce to you this concept of hypotensive or limited resuscitation, because this is a really, a really a change in paradigm. So the question is, if you are bleeding and your body uses its normal mechanisms of uh, homeostasis to form a clot and control that bleeding, if you give fluid to that patient that now has a pressure of 70 too aggressively to the point that that pressure goes from 70 to 110. Is there a risk that you will pop that clot that's controlling bleeding? And the, the therapy that you're using to treat bleeding is going to aggravate the bleeding, make the bleeding worse. So this concept of popping the clot is a concept that's very important. In addition, if you give a lot of crystalloid, you're diluting the plasma and you're diluting the coagulation factor. So the patients may go into this dilutional coagulopathy and the fluid is room temperature most of the time. And no matter how careful you are in warming fluids, etc., if you give a lot of crystalloids, it's been our experience, all of us, that the temperature drops and they become colder and hypothermic. So if you pop the clot, they bleed more. If they develop coagulopathy, they will bleed more. If they develop hypothermia, they will bleed more. So should we be doing this? I mean, this is a dogma. This is a concept that's been in place for 50 years, and we never questioned, and just recently has been uh, questioned. So people go to the laboratory. They develop animal models. There is some variability in animal models. The clinical data is still inconclusive. But the question is out there, and we need to be a little more thoughtful, and perhaps we don't need to be too aggressive. So this is a, an intraoperative picture just to situate you. The head is on that side, the foot's on this side. This is the liver, the left side of the liver, the right side of the liver. And back here, all this dark stuff that you can see very well is a big clot. So this guy had a big liver laceration. We went in because he was hypotensive. He had a positive diagnostic peritoneal lavage. And we said, okay, we got to look. We opened the belly and that clot sitting on this big liver laceration, but he's not actively bleeding. So the concept is that this is a hemostatic clot. The guy is alive because he developed clot. If I cause him to, to, to become coagulopathic, that clot will go away, he will bleed and he will die. If I give him too much blood, I may pop that clot. So that, that's the concept. Some people, they come in alive because they have their own mechanisms to, to uh, control the bleeding, developing the clot. And we should not mess with that clot. The same with ruptured triple A's. This is an abdominal aortic aneurysm that's already, uh, that's ready to pop. If you increase the blood pressure from 60 to 100 just by giving fluids, these people will, will bleed to death before you have a chance to put your hand there. So. Isn't it smarter to just go to the operating room, control hemorrhage, and then you resuscitate people? So instead of resuscitating first and then controlling bleeding, you control bleeding first and then you resuscitate. So that's the change in paradigm that people are considering. <clears throat> so uh, this has been studied actually, and people have used some computer modeling to say, well, how much you bleed, how much do you need to bleed until you die? 
and what's the rate of bleeding, what are the variables that are important. So if you get a 70 kilogram male that bleeds 25 cc's per minute, that person will bleed a liter and a half per hour. So if you lose a liter and a half of blood, you're gonna be hypotensive. So in one hour, that patient will be hypotensive. But if you lose twice as much, you're gonna be dead in two hours if there is no bleeding control. So the rate here is important, and it tells you that in two hours, if you bleed at 25 cc's per hour, you will be dead if nothing is done. Now, if you have a bad injury, like an aortic injury, a vena cava injury, a bad liver injury, and you're bleeding 100 cc's per hour, uh, per minute, you're gonna bleed six liters in the first hour. So you're gonna be hypotensive in 15 minutes and you're gonna be dead in half an hour. Those two patients are different. So what I'm trying to say is that perhaps one model doesn't fit all. So patients that have a low rate of bleeding, you have more time, you can give them a little more fluid, you can wait a li little longer, make the diagnosis, etc. But people that are bleeding significantly giving more fluid will make the, them bleed more and won't help them. But there is a threshold below which if they are bleeding too, too much, uh, they need fluid to stay alive. So it's always a balance. So the new treatment assumption is that for the most part in trauma centers across America, fluid is not needed unless uh, transport time is greater than 30 minutes. So there is a, a, a trend in this country now that medics may use a lot less fluid. And you, we are seeing this. A lot more people are coming in without IVs. They are not bothering getting IVs like in the past and staying and playing or trying to struggle in the back of the ambulance. If they're gonna be in the trauma center in eight, 10, 12, 15 minutes, they don't bother because they know this data and they know that most people will be okay if you don't give them anything if transport time is less than 30 minutes. The other concept that has changed is now that we accept lower blood pressures. We don't panic as much as we used to. And maybe a blood pressure of 80 systolic is okay. We don't need to react too much. Now, the patient comes in with a systolic of 80. I want to know what's wrong with the patient. But I'm thinking more he's bleeding and I need to control bleeding rather than I'm going to give a ton of fluid to this guy Why I figure out what's wrong with him because that fluid may bring that pressure from 80 to 120 and then down to 50 because he will pop the clot and he will bleed more. Most people that come in hypotensive will be very sick if you don't control hemorrhage in two hours. So you don't have that much time and I think time is, is critical here. And remember that the fluids will raise the blood pressure but won't stop the bleeding. So the goal is to stop the bleeding rather than just raising the blood pressure. Again, there is a, a limit. Uh, there is a blood pressure below which people won't perfuse very well. So maybe a little bit of fluid is necessary. We haven't figured out exactly how much in which circumstance, but clinical judgment is important. But the concept now is that it's better to control bleeding rather than fluid resuscitate up front. And this was... Uh, <clears throat> was a, a concept that was developed by this famous trauma surgeon from Houston, Dr. Maddox, who published a paper and said, you know, in, in Houston they look at uh, not giving fluids during the pre-hospital uh, phase of care for patients with penetrating injuries, and patients that didn't get any fluid did better than patients that got fluid. Uh, and I'll show you the data. <clears throat> so he developed this concept of hypotensive resuscitation. Fluid resuscitation that's sufficient to allow vital organ preservation, perfusion, but it keeps the risk of bleeding as low as possible. So you give a little bit, but you don't give too much, otherwise that clot will pop. So that's the concept. <clears throat> there are two strategies. Some, obviously, there are some people out there that are more radical. So they say, don't give any fluid, <clears throat> like Maddox did in Houston. No fluid until you put your finger in the bleeding vessel. And some people say, give a little bit of fluid, but accept a lower blood pressure. So permissive hypotension rather than no fluid. So you just lower your endpoints. You, are, you accept a little more, which is a change in paradigm, particularly for us. 
Now, is this new? Like everything in medicine, things go in cycles. There is nothing new, okay? I, I'm a researcher. I have a basic science laboratory, you guys know. And we think that we discover things every day. No, we don't discover anything. Somebody did it already. If you search the literature, it's already there. And some important concepts that we think we are discovering today were <clears throat> discussed, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago. Nothing is new, just things go into cycles. So this guy had the same idea. He said the injection of a fluid that will increase blood pressure has dangers in itself. Hemorrhage may not have occurred to a marked degree because the blood pressure has been too low to overcome the obstacle offered by a clot. And this guy was a physiologist that lived during the World War I and II. He said that nobody paid attention. So these things go to sleep for 30, 40, 50 years. And then some genius writes a paper and does something in the lab and says, oh, I'm creating something new. No, it was there already. We just didn't pay enough attention. But the concept is not, is not new. So there is some evidence. This is the study from Houston. They look at almost 600 people, penetrating injury. To enter in the study, you had to have a systolic less than 90. And they <clears throat> randomize into two groups, give fluids immediately or give fluids only when you control bleeding in the operating room. And they show that people that didn't get any fluid survived 10% more. And uh, <clears throat> there are several methodological problems in the study, but the study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So it has to, it has to be a good study. And uh, <clears throat> it's interesting to see how many, uh, to see how, how much reaction this paper got from the scientific community when it was published about eight years ago. Now, there are other, other studies that have looked at uh, hypotensive resuscitation. <clears throat> And this is the study that showed that if transport time is less than uh, 30 minutes, uh, there is no benefit from pre-hospital uh, resuscitation. So if you're going to get to the trauma center quickly, you should actually scoop and run instead of stay and play. And control bleeding is more important than uh, <clears throat> um, fluid resuscitation. This is an interesting one. I'm just showing this because you know, I had a professor when I was a medical student that said to me, kid, a piece of paper accepts anything you write on it. The paper will never complain. So the, a piece of paper is the best friend of a scientist. And that stayed with me my whole career. Then I read a paper like this, publishing a good journal, and, and I really understand that a piece of paper accepts any crap you, you want to write on it, you know? <laughs> I'm not saying this is too bad, but read this. So this Dr. Dimitriad is a famous trauma surgeon in Los Angeles. I have a lot of respect for him. But about several years ago, he, he looked at outcomes in patients transported by EMS to USC LA County uh, by private vehicles or the police. So that he compared EMS versus every other transport type. And after controlling for multiple factors, according to him, unrelated to mode of transportation, patients that came in by private vehicles or by the police or were dropped at the front of the hospital by train or whatever, they were more likely to survive than patients transported by EMS. I don't think the EMS in Los Angeles County was very happy with him when he published this paper. The medics probably hate him. But he said this effect was greatest in the most severely injured patients. And delays in transportation and the use of intravenous fluid may contribute to increased mortality. I mean, this is a smart man. And with all kidding aside, even if this is a bad study, that methodology is not right and if there are problems, the idea is there. We got to revisit our principles and our dogmas, the things that we take for granted, the things that we've been taught and double check them every, every once in a while because we may not be doing the right thing. And what's right in 1980 may be not the appropriate thing to do in 2010. But the idea is there. This concept of maybe fluid's not necessary. Maybe we give it too much. Maybe we spend too much time. And then there are other studies, uh, but nobody can define just yet what's the lower limit that you accept in terms of blood pressure that you don't need to react to it immediately. 
Then there are animal studies the the models are all inconsistent. It's very difficult to look at the the studies in animals and try to try to translate it into clinical practice. But, you know, I think that when I look at all this literature, the summary for you today is that the best strategy hasn't been completely defined. One thing I'm absolutely convinced that one protocol does not fit all. If we think that you know, things like ATLS that say two liters to everybody is the right thing to do, that's wrong. We gotta, we gotta tailor our approach according to what the patient physiology is. But most people would accept a systolic of 80 to 90 uh, as reasonable. Although there is not great data, that's what most of the studies are showing. You don't need to react too much in terms of fluid resuscitation if the systolic is 80 to 90. If that happens, you need to focus on controlling hemorrhage and figuring out where the patient is bleeding from. And perhaps you need to give enough fluid to keep the blood pressure at those levels. But we don't need to flood those people with crystalloid. Now, we, the nurses that have been around for a long time, uh, I'm sure you've realized that we don't see patients with ARDS after resuscitation anymore. ARDS seems to be a disease that is disappearing in the ICU. I, I'm sure you remember 10, 15 years ago, we had young people that received 30, 40, 50 liters of crystalloid. The next day, the lungs are white. They are on the ventilator for a week. We got them through and they survived for the most part. But we don't see those things anymore. Why? I'm sure it's because we are giving a lot less fluid. And when we resuscitate them, we are being a little more aggressive in giving blood and FFP earlier rather than later. So it, I think we changed it already, even if we, don't, we didn't say that clearly, uh, uh, we, we already changed our practice. But this is why things are changing, because people are accepting a little more hypotension and uh, less fluid resuscitation. Now, let me tell you a little bit of bad news because you all know that we've been involved with hypertonic saline research for many, many years in this trauma center. And recently we participated in the ROC trial. And uh, we had uh, an expectation that using hypertonic saline, and, and which is, makes you use a lot less volume than lactated ringers, you would provide enough fluid resuscitation and tissue perfusion and at least hypertonic saline should be equal uh, in terms of effectiveness co as compared to, to crystalloid LR or normal saline. The NIH funded the study, $50 million were spent in 10 centers in the United States and Canada. We did two studies, one in shock and one in traumatic brain injury. Both studies were stopped for futility because there was no difference. So I think this is the, the death of hypertonic saline uh, in, in this country. Uh, the studies are being published soon, and uh, hypertonic saline uh, was not superior to normal saline. So I, I guess that question will be put to rest uh, as both trials were stopped for futility. But it was a good thing to do then because we, we were able to to have uh, almost 1,700 patients on the study, which uh, nobody could do elsewhere in the, con in, the, in the world. How much more time I have? Okay, so let me uh, talk to new transfusion strategies just very quickly, because it goes along with this fluid resuscitation strategy. Uh, so if you're not gonna give a lot of crystalloids, and we should be giving something, some folks out there coming from <clears throat> the, the military background and their experience in Iraq and Afghanistan are saying, you know, maybe if you're gonna give something, it should be FFP and, and, and red cells. And the idea is that coagulopathy uh, occurs very early on uh, and it's unrelated to uh, consumption of coagulation factors that may occur a day or two or three after the injury. But these people are saying, that patients that are severely injured, they come to the trauma center and they already, upon admission, have an elevated INR. The first study came out of Houston, different hospital from Dr. Maddox. This is UT Houston, very busy trauma center, 5,000 trauma admissions a year, and they see a lot of stuff there. 
And these guys have a, a very uh, <coughs> structured massive transfusion protocol. And this is what they did. They measure coagulation parameters in every patient that hit the door as part of their trauma lab panel. And they said that the most severely injured patients, they hit the ED with an INR of 1.8. As they arrived to the trauma center, the INR was already 1.8. So if you have significant injuries, and these people had an ISS of 29, injury severity score of 29 is very high. It tells you that they have injuries all over the body. Uh, they come in already coagulopathic. We don't know about this because we don't measure this routinely, but they, they figured this out. And so these people come in, they undergo a lot of, a lot of things in resuscitation, operations, injury embolization, et cetera, et cetera. At some point, they get to the ICU. In their experience, it takes six hours for them to get a very sick person that goes to the trauma center back into the ICU because they go to the OR, they go here, they go there. And it turns out when they go to the ICU and they measure the second INR, it's still elevated at 1.6. So they look at this and say, gee, we are doing a poor job. They come in, they are coagulopathic. Six hours later, we did a bunch of stuff to them, they are still coagulopathic. What is the problem? So they start looking at the amount of blood and uh, the amount of cells in FFP. And if you look here, these people got 12 units of blood, but only five units of FFP. And they said, you know, if you give cells, but you don't replace coagulation factors, they will remain coagulopathic. So maybe the ratio between FFP and PEC cells is not adequate in our protocol. Let me go quickly through this. So at the same time, the military came out with this statement. Despite some controversy, general consensus was reached in the military that in the most severely injured patients, early use of red cells, plasma, and platelets still offers the best chance of limiting coagulopathy of trauma in the early phase of care. And why did they say that? Because they had a bunch of 18, 19 year old healthy kids donating blood and blood was quickly processed and infused in a soldier that was wounded next door. So they have this live blood banks, right? People form a line and they donate and that blood is immediately infused. And they were not separating the blood components and really infusing whole blood. So they said, how do we translate that to the civilian practice? Well, now you have to separate everything that's in blood. Now you just put them back together. So get plasma, get cells, get, FF, uh, get platelets. And all of a sudden you would be transfusing sort of whole blood or reconstituted whole blood. And this would be an important concept for civilian uh, trauma centers. And they put out this paper that they look at the ratio of PEC cells and plasma. And this is very, very striking to me. Uh, this is data from Iraq. If, if, if soldiers were resuscitated with a ratio of eight units of red cells to one unit of plasma, their mortality was 65%. If the ratio dropped to 2.5 to one, the mortality dropped to half, 34%. And if you use a one-to-one -one ratio or close to one-to-one, -one, mortality dropped to 19%, considering that everything is the same. So I think this is very important because it makes us think, are we doing the right thing? And, and if we are not, like the guys in Houston realized that six hours later when you get to the unit, they are still coagulopathic and you miss six hours as the window of opportunity to fix the coagulopathy, what can you change? This is what you can change. Change the ratio between red cells and FFP transfusion. So we thought about that. We, you all know we have a new massive transfusion protocol. Every time we get O negative blood, we get four units of FFP, it comes as a package. And the blood bank now understands that if we tell them massive transfusion protocol, they will give us 10 units of blood, but they will give us 10 units of FFP. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So to summarize what I, I would like you to take home today, less fluid, accept a little more of uh, lower blood pressure, so accept some permissive hypotension is probably okay. Change the ratio of PEC cells and FFP to a, a 
make it closer to a one-to-one -one ratio is probably beneficial. Because think about this. If you give water and salt, you increase intravascular volume, but it doesn't increase your oxygen carry capacity. Your perfusion may be better because your intravascular volume is higher, but you don't have cells to carry oxygen to the tissues. And what are you losing? You're losing blood, so you should receive blood. So I'm not advocating that we increase the number of blood transfusions we do. I, I'm just advocating that for the fact that we need to be smarter the way we transfuse and giving red cells only and little plasma won't do it because you need to have a balance between oxygen carrying capacity and uh, coagulation factors to make hemostasis uh, easier for the patient and to form that clot and to control uh, hemorrhage. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll, I'll answer any questions. Dana, what's up? A resurgence of whole blood coming around, or do you think they'll continue to fractionate? Yeah, I think in civilian practice, it's going to be very, very difficult for us to go back to whole blood. Um, because, it, you know, blood transfusion is not just used for bleeding, right? So there are a number of other diseases that benefit from component transfusion. And I think it's going to be very, very difficult to change that culture again and go back to whole blood. I don't think the fractionation is a bad thing. I just think that we may need to be uh, more proactive in trying to reconstitute whole blood. Now, let me tell you this. If you get a, a bag of whole blood, it has a crit of 45, has about 120,000 platelets, and most of the coagulation factors are at normal levels. If you get a bag of FFP, a bag of cells, and 10 packs of platelets, and put it all together, what you get in the end is a crit of 33, not 45. You get about 89% of the coagulation factors in terms of their levels, and you get about 85,000 platelets, not 120,000. So the reconstitution is not the real thing, but it's as close as you can get. So one-to-one -one will probably get you to as close as you can to whole blood, but it's not whole blood. But it's better than crystalloid. So I think those things are changing very rapidly. Uh, I'm sure some of you have seen us ordering a little more O-negative blood in the recess room for people that come in hypotensive with bad pelvic fractures. We had an open pelvic fracture recently. And what uh, we are trying to collect some data uh, and, and we'll look at this uh, population um, <clears throat> when we have enough data. But our clinical impression now is that these people are staying less time on the ventilator, they're developing less organ failure, they're getting a lot less crystalloid, they have a lot less uh, pulmonary failure than before. So considering everything, I think uh, these are new paradigms that we need to be uh, uh, thinking about, and I, I hope this presentation uh, will bring you up to speed on that. Thank you very much.